My name is Rosie O'Brien Wojtek and I'm an Assistant Executive Director of the Connecticut Association of Schools. We at CAS are very excited to collaborate with the Office of Early Childhood, the Connecticut State Department of Education, and the Regional Education Service Center's RESC Alliance to support the needs of all of Connecticut's youngest learners, including children with special needs and other vulnerable populations by sharing with you the most current information as well as research and best practices for early childhood education. There's so much to think about as we design and implement teaching and learning during the 2020 school year, especially for our youngest students across the state. So we're really glad that you're here with us today. Just a couple of quick reminders. Everyone's been muted to begin with, but once we get into the breakout rooms, please unmute yourself so that you can talk with each other. If possible, please turn your video on as it's nice to be able to see everyone, especially when we're working in small groups. When we're working as a whole group, you may ask questions in the chat or raise your hand with a button at the bottom of the screen to be recognized. Please use the chat feature to ask questions, share ideas, and let us know if you experience any technical problems during the Zoom meeting as we will be monitoring the chat. However, when you're in the breakout rooms, the chat feature is only seen by the people in your breakout rooms. So if you have questions or need help when you are in the breakout rooms, please use the help button and one of the hosts will respond. This webinar is being recorded, but only during the whole group activities. We're unable to record the small group conversations during the breakout room portion of the webinar. However, the rest of the webinar will be recorded and will be posted for future viewing. So please be sure to share the link to this webinar with your colleagues once it's posted on the CAS, OEC, CSDE, and RESC websites. Again, I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining us today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our facilitator for this continued roundtable conversation, East Con's Early Childhood Specialist, Anne-Marie Davidson. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Rosie. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to take a moment to echo um, Rosie's welcome to all of you. Uh, we know that time is definitely an issue um, and it's very precious, so we do um, thank you for being here and appreciate you taking the time to come and spend a little bit of time with us this afternoon. Um, sort of on that note, uh, I just wanted to, again, to recognize that there's a lot that's been going on um, during this start of this school year. The changes continue to, to um, arrive and uh, all of that does certainly bring about different and varying emotions in all of us. Um, and so we recognize that you may have joined us today, not necessarily feeling um, happy, um, right? You may feel a little tired or a little crabby, um, but we, again, just want you to be able to take some deep breaths right now. We have an hour together. We're going to talk specifically about specially designed instruction and supporting um, young children with IEPs and that specific feature of our responsibility as um, early childhood educators. Um, but we want you to take a deep breath, um, be able to enjoy this moment and this opportunity for learning, um, engage in some reflection, um, because we do also recognize that uh, you have been doing things already. We are, oh goodness, about six weeks into the school year, maybe more than that. Um, and a lot of planning happened over the summer as well. So you have been already addressing providing services to children with IEPs. You've already been addressing um, providing specially designed instruction. So um, we, again, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on what you've been doing maybe think about it in a slightly different way. Um, we're gonna share some tools today that might help you think about and or plan your specially designed instruction um, in a slightly different way. So again, it's an opportunity to reflect, um, an opportunity to take a deep breath and get focused on just this one very small piece of what you do. We recognize that there's a lot um, that you are doing and that you are responsible for doing, um, but again, Right for this next hour, we're here talking about specially designed instruction and supporting young children with IEPs in this current context um, that we're sitting in. So I'm gonna talk kind of at you for a little while, again, specifically about specially designed instruction and then about getting to an implementation plan. 
Um, and then we will have an opportunity for some small group. Well, we'll have some opportunity for practice, um, but then we'll have some opportunity for some small group um, discussion at the very end. However, um, there is a chat, obviously, um, in Zoom. So please feel free to put a question, comment, or thought into your chat box. Um, and uh, we do have people monitoring the chat, so they would be happy to share those so we can pause and have a discussion if we need to. Raise your hand, certainly use the raise your hand feature um, if you would like to do that as well. Um, so it doesn't mean that we can't um, have those uh, interactions. Um, this is just what we have planned for today. So as I said, we're uh, talking today really about specially designed instruction, but the reality is that um, this first part of our conversation is sort of meant to get everybody, give everybody some background knowledge or to review, or maybe to, again, to support you in sort of rethinking and reflecting on what you think about instruction and what you think about specially designed instruction. Um, but the reality is that we can't have that conversation about what we do for young children with IEPs without having a conversation about, um, again, instruction in general and what education is meant to provide for all children. Um, and so when we think about education in general, right, its purpose is really to provide a benefit, um, to help support children to grow and develop, to learn certain things at each grade level, right? And again, in general, regardless of what grade um, children are in, students are in, uh, teachers plan learning experiences. That's the mechanism that we use to help them achieve that benefit. In order for them to be able to achieve the benefit in the learning experiences, everyone has to be able to access and participate in those learning experiences. And again, that's not unique to any student um, who comes through the doors of a school, and it's not unique to a teacher teaching a different grade level or a different content area, right? That is sort of the basic equation. The reason that that's important to think about is because the purpose of special education was never to create something separate. It really was to be that bridge, right? So we have what we want for all children, all students in education, and then we recognize that we also have some children who come to us with some really individualized learning needs. And special education and the tools that we have within special education were really meant to, um, again, to form that bridge um, for the student with some really specific needs to be able to get to that same benefit, right? So again, as we start to think or look more specifically at specially designed instruction and what it, it is, we really need to keep in mind that for kids with disabilities, for kids with an IEP, that this equation stays the same, right? What we are adding or surrounding it with or um, layering on top of whatever sort of visual or whatever um, you know, description resonates with you is their own individualized strategies based on their individual needs and the really intentional use of those strategies. And so again, part of what we're gonna talk about today is how to be really, really intentional about that um, and how to think about doing that in the different context that we might find ourselves in. Um, and most of my interactions with programs, even if your program is open five days a week and you have some kiddos coming into your building five days a week, most people have at least one or maybe two students whose families chose to keep them home and participate entirely in remote learning. So um, what we're gonna talk about really applies across all of those contexts, but most people are, most teachers are trying to address learning for kids across contexts, um, even if your district model is five days a week in the building. Um, so again, just a reminder again about what special education is intended to do. It is intended to address access and participation in the learning experiences that we design for all children so that they can um, obtain that benefit. 
And again, it is articulated in IDEA, right? There's six principles of IDEA. The first principle is around free appropriate public education. And basically that just means that kids with disabilities have a right to education just like everybody else. But again, there's a reference to what do special ed programs have to include they have to help the student make progress in the general ed curriculum, okay? So again, as we start to move through talking about how we get to an implementation plan, it's important that we remember that that's what our job is. Um, it always has been, and again, in this different context, um, we still need to continue to keep that at the forefront of what we're doing. So specifically, what is specially designed instruction? Uh, you might not have seen this since you all were in your preparation programs for becoming a special ed teacher, but this is the definition from the regs of specially designed instruction. And again, when we start to think about how we make sure that we're planning and implementing this stuff, it's important to remember that we can change the content, we can change the methodology, or we can change the delivery of instruction. And we'll look at those a little bit more in depth and look at some um, examples of what each of those things are. But again, even within the definition of specially designed instruction, we are reminded that the reason it's in place is to ensure access to the general ed curriculum, okay? So as I said, uh, we'll look at it a little bit more closely. So what does content mean? Well, content really comes directly from our standards from our, or from our curriculum, right? Um, and we have a choice when we talk about providing specially designed instruction related to content, we basically have two choices. One is that we keep the goal the same, same goal from the curriculum, but we are going to apply accommodations and specially designed instruction to helping the student achieve that goal, or we are going to choose a different goal and that basically equals a modification. So when we, again, when we think about specially designed instruction related to content, those are our two choices. We're either keeping the goal the same as we are applying specially designed instruction to the same goal or we're using a different goal. When we think about changing the methodology, methodology within SDI refers to programs or practices. So things like visuals, the use of visuals, things, modeling, um, social stories, handwriting without tears is a program that could be implemented to support a child's um, writing skills. Um, and that counts as their specially designed instruction. Um, and then when we think about instructional strategies, we think about things like uh, peer modeling, right, breaking down language or directions, um, using pre-teaching, um, and again, each of these things, um, some of this stuff, right, we do on a day-to-day -day basis for everybody in our class, right, but again, the reminder is that what we're saying is that for this child, for this student, it is required in order for them to be able to access and participate in that learning experience, in that piece of the general ed curriculum. It's a requirement or they're not going to be able to obtain the benefit that other students would obtain. Um, and so it, again, it may be that we're doing some of this for everybody, um, but if you took that away, for other students, they would still be able to obtain the benefit and for this student, they wouldn't. Um, so things like, right, these are some examples. So it would be the, the goal or the objective could be given explicit small group instruction in using problem, a problem solving process and solution cards, the child will, and then your behavior, right? Given repetition in a small group, child will, okay? so. Um, we should be, right, and we're also required to embed examples of or what the child needs in terms of accommodations and specially designed instruction in our objectives. Um, and so that also is an important thing to remember as we start to move into looking at an implementation plan. The last thing that I um, wanted to remind us about um, is just that, 
um, IDEA defines early childhood curriculum or curriculum for preschool age children with IEPs in a slightly different way than they define curriculum for K to 12. Um, and that is that they recognize that um, typical developmentally appropriate activities are reflective of the general ed curriculum for preschool age um, kids. They learn in ways that are embedded into typical developmentally appropriate activities. Um, and that's important to remember, especially in this conversation, especially for our kiddos who are at home. Um, even though they're not in school anymore, their typical developmentally appropriate activities has become the parts of the day that they engage in when they're at home. Um, and so we're gonna look at some examples of how specially designed instruction could be uh, shared with families and embedded into the routines of a child's day. Um, so therefore we're still meeting our requirements within um, the child's IEP because we have this ability to recognize that general ed curriculum is um, defined as developmentally appropriate activities. So I'm gonna pause there I know we're kind of a large group. Um, I talked kind of fast, but does anyone have any questions, comments, or thoughts about what we just talked about? So again, feel free to put it in the chat box or raise your hand if, um, if you want to. And I'll take a moment to have a drink of water. I don't see any of my colleagues unmuting themselves to alert me to anything. So no, there, we don't have any, and nothing's popped up yet in the um, in the chat. Okay. All right. So um, again, that information really probably was review for most of you, um, but again, sort of sets the groundwork for where we're headed as we start to talk about um, getting to an implementation plan. Um, before we do that, or, or at, to start our conversation actually related to um, the implementation plan, I just wanted to pause. There's, um, there is a resource that was created through the Division for Early Childhood, which for people, if you aren't aware, is our Early Childhood Special Educator Professional Organization. It is a um, component of the Council for Exceptional Children. And uh, DEC focuses on um, practices and um, training and resources developed specifically for teachers who teach, uh, or, or yeah, teachers who teach young children with disabilities. Um, they developed a set of recommended practices that are intended, again, to guide our practice as early childhood special educators. Um, there's different topics that those recommended practices fall under. One of them is um, around instruction. And so I just put in here two of those instructional practices that are identified under the DEC recommended practices. The first is naturalistic instruction. And again, becomes really important as we're starting to think about um, having children in different contexts and still being by specially designed instruction. Um, so naturalistic instruction, again, takes advantage of the fact that children are already participating in activities, right? And that we can use our interaction with them to help them grow related to whatever knowledge or skill we want to be focused on during their participation in that, um, in that activity, right? Um, and again, when we're thinking about supporting families potentially to provide instruction or to support their children's growth and development, um, this is a really um, um, makes a lot of sense in terms of practice that we can use. It's research-based, evidence-based, um, and it's again, it's a practice that we can use in supporting families to be able to interact with their children and also um, community-based early childhood providers, because we might have. Um, children who are now spending time in community-based settings and we're helping to support their needs um, there as well. 
The second um, instructional practice that's included today is about is called embedded instruction, um, right? And there's the difference between this is that we um, between naturalistic instruction, right? Is that um, we want to initiate a behavior with a child, right? Um, and um, we are starting to think about what are the pieces of this particular activity that are linked to the child's goal that helps us um, be able to have that growth potential for kiddos. So if you haven't ever gone to the DEC website um, and looked at their resources, um, looked at the recommended practices, I would suggest that um, you do. There's a lot of tools there that could help you identify what the practice is and there's video clips of teachers using practices so you get to actually see what it looks like. Um, and the link is on the last page of our uh, PowerPoint today. Um, but, and the PowerPoint will be posted after our um, session. So you can get to those recommended practices, but I would definitely recommend that you do that if you haven't ever explored those resources. Okay, so Anne Marie, there is a question in the chat box. Yep. And it's a very relevant question. Sure. Um, I'll read it out loud. Um, there is very little that is developmentally appropriate about, about instructing preschoolers online. Right. Okay. Uh, what are some specific strategies to use if we are fully remote? And I think this will connect to what are those families' routines and ac experience and activities at home. Right, right. Yes, I agree with the not developmental appropriateness. Um, and so I think that, yeah, when we get to looking at um, the implementation plan, as Judy said, um, that it, it could be a very big shift, but if we start to think, if we go back to that sort of, um, our job is to provide access and participation in the general ed curriculum. And if we define general ed curriculum as developmentally appropriate activities, then um, it becomes less about what we are doing um, and what more about what, how we can support families. So, but we're, we're gonna look at an example um, of, of that. So, um, and again, if it doesn't, if this doesn't help, then feel free to ask more questions. Um, and, oh, also we are planning to do um, continued um, discussion around this within our regions. So that also could be another place where we get to dig deeper into this. Because it's hard to, do it all in an hour. Um, thank you. So basically when we're thinking about getting to an implementation plan, right? This is just sort of the flow chart. We still start with the IEP. Then we're gonna look at a um, tool called an embedded activity matrix, which most of you have probably seen, um, but we will review that. We're going to look at something called a decision-making guide, and then ultimately look at some examples of some implementation plans. In order to do this, um, as I said, we're just gonna work from this as a sample IEP goal and objective, right? So that we have something um, to look at as we move through this. Um, but at this point, again, it's um, an hour and, um, you know, we wanted to be able to get through stuff. So at this point, if you, let's just pause, if you have access to your IEPs, Go ahead and open up an IEP that you um, are current, well, have currently working on, right? Um, or if you don't have access to your IEPs, just think about an objective that you're currently working on um, with a child. Because I'm going to show you the next form, and then we're going to pause and have you practice um, actually putting your information into um, the embedded matrix, okay? So take a minute, pull up an IEP electronically if you have one, um, or again, just 
stop and think about an objective that you're currently working on supporting a child to obtain. So this is the embedded activity matrix. And um, the purpose of it is really to help us start to analyze where is access and participation impacted by the child's need, right? So our sample objective was around initiating verbal interaction with a peer, right? Um, using language for social interaction. So that's an area of need for Anne Marie. And um, when we think about, right, remember again that um, early childhood curriculum is defined as typical developmentally appropriate activities, right? So this allows you basically to plot out your day across the top. And again, this can work in, this is, looks like a, um, an early childhood classroom schedule, right? But we could do this with a home schedule, right? So wake up, um, morning routine, then there might be breakfast, then there might be some playtime, right? Um, so you can put any sequence of instruction or any routine across the top. Goals or objectives go over here. And then we ask ourselves the question, does Anne-Marie's difficulty initiating a verbal interaction with a peer impact her ability to access or participate in arrival? And the what makes you or what has to go into that question is, what are the learning outcomes? What are things kids are learning? What's the benefit that they're gaining from participating in this part of the general ed curriculum? And one of the things that children or students are generally going to achieve is there is verbal interaction, right? There's opportunities to learn how to do that during arrival. Anne Marie's difficulty with this does impact her ability to access and participate and gain benefit from the arrival routine. So you put a star or a check mark in here. And then you work your way across the day. Right? Um, and so that's then, right? We are now we know that we need to think about how we're going to support Anne Marie during arrival, snack, and center time because the benefit that she's going to gain from accessing and participating in those parts of her um, curriculum is not going to be obtained unless we do something different. Okay, so that's the embedded activity matrix. And again, the, the question we're asking is, does this need impact access and participation and therefore benefit in this part of the um, instruction during the day? The general ed curriculum. So we've already said that we identified that that area of need for Anne Marie is affected, um, affects her access and participation and benefit during snack. And so now I need to plan my accommodations and specially designed instruction. Nope, sorry, I said I was going to do something. So pause for a minute. Um, we will put actually. Jean, are you able? No, you don't have that form. So just on a piece of paper, I should have put before we started this, um, the form in the chat box. But you can just sketch out your day, take the objective that you chose a minute ago from your IEP and practice putting um, or making that decision. Where does that objective um, affect access and participation? Okay. And then take one of those, right? And that's basically the next step as I said, is that now we're gonna to start to plan um, our accommodations and um, specially designed instruction. And what that's based on again is 
what is the goal for all children? Part of the goal during snack is that all children are learning how to have conversations with each other. The next question you ask yourself is, is the goal for Anne-Marie similar? Yes, it is. But if we just use our typical teaching strategies, then she will not be able to access and participate. And therefore her benefit will be less. So the answer to that question is no. And so then again, right? But we don't need a new goal from the IEP or a modification. And so then we start to design our specially designed instruction. Right. The next step in that process then is to start to design an implementation plan. So we take those examples of accommodations and specially designed instruction and we plot them all out, right? Because Amory doesn't only have one objective, she has more than one objective. And we start to plot them out into an implementation plan. Um, I'm changing my mind about how we're going to do things. So I just want to move to the next um, step. So Regardless of whether um, we are teaching children in still in our classroom, right? Or we're teaching them remotely, the purpose is still the same. Our responsibility is still the same. It is, we have a responsibility to providing access and participation in the, those learning experiences and supporting children individually. So this is a sample implementation plan for remote learning, right? So we still have the same objective. Amory's IEP hasn't changed. The learning experience that we're planning for our remote learning is a group snack. Um, so I still have a routine as part of my group snack. It's going to include welcome and greeting, and then we're gonna eat. So I still need to think about how does this need impact her ability to access and participate in the welcome and greeting? And I need to think about, okay, so what is gonna be my specially designed instruction or, and or accommodation during that part of this learning experience? So I'm going to provide a verbal prompt, okay? And then the place where it might really start to change is that I may need to support the family in the use of those conversation cards. So now maybe my Zoom individual Zoom time, right? is not necessarily with Anne-Marie, although some of it might be, right? Because I might pre-teach her how to use it, but maybe the family, the parent and the child are participating together as I teach both of them how to use those conversation cards so that the parent can support the child um, during group snack. So I'm gonna pause here because I think I saw, did I see? My little chat screen drops down. Is so there um, it was the question was asked if they would have access to if participants would have access to the slideshow. And I said, yes, we can certainly make them available. Yes. OK, <clears throat> so um, I just want to go back for a minute, right, because um, again, the one of the contexts that children might be participating in now is a center based program. Um, and so again, this may apply to a school district based um, program, but it also might apply to a center based program. And so then part of what needs to happen 
that might not be happening is the collaboration or a connection with the early childhood teacher, the community-based program director and teacher to talk about and to share this information with them as well so that they can implement um, the uh, accommodations and specially designed instruction for that child. So again, we're still meeting our requirements within the IEP. We just have to take into account that some things have changed. Some things haven't, right? Um, but some things have changed and primarily it is around the location and where children might be learning. So Emery, can I um, just jump in here? So I'm thinking if you think about this from a different perspective, um, I think a lot of special ed teachers and speech pathologists, when they're approaching this, feel they have to develop the activity. They have to try to come up with something on Zoom that is the activity, as opposed to really rethinking what curriculum is, what developmentally appropriate looks like, and that you're supporting the adults in the child's environment mm -hmm. in order to access typical daily activities and routines with regard to what that child's specific needs are. So I'm thinking about you know, verbally initiating a conversation with anyone because oftentimes, because we get these questions, well, there's no other children in the home. Mm -hmm. It's just a child and adult. Well, there's hopefully the three-year-old is not all by themselves and there is an adult. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about what that looks like. So it's, it's a relationship based model, very similar to what we use in birth to three, mm -hmm. where we're supporting the adults in the child's environment to be implementers. Mm -hmm. And if you think, if you shift how we are, if you shift your thinking and do it that way, think of how much more often that specially designed instruction and those accommodations can be implemented all day throughout the day, because you, instead of giving someone a fish, you're teaching them how to fish. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. right. And it does say, Julie mentioned, you know, relationship. It is a relationship-based strategy. And not all families are going to be like, yes, I'm gung-ho. And it's not also not to say, right, this is an example of a teacher who's, you know, you're doing, you're leading group stack, right? So this is actually sort of a blended model because you've spent some time uh, Zooming and meeting with the family um, to talk about strategies, but you're leading um, the snack, right? So um, it doesn't have to be either or. It could be a weekly read aloud that you do, but now you have included the family in um, providing the specially designed instruction. Um, but yes, those are all, and those are shifts, right? And, and that's also something that you have to think about and plan. How do you initiate this um, with families? But I also think, right, we're, we might be at that phase in the year where people, some programs are closing for a couple of weeks, right? We're seeing cases pop up. So um, to, in, to some of, um, effect, if we move in this direction and start to move in this direction now, you may be ready for that time when Hopefully it won't happen, but when um, we close our doors again to everybody. So um, this is an example of what it could look like um, if we did this solely by embedding things into the child's home routine. Um, and again, that's sort of a conversation with families in terms of which direction, you know, um, they want to go in. But basically, and this is just flipped around, right? Their schedule is down the side and the goals are across the top as opposed to the other version. Um, and then we start to think about what is it that the child is accomplishing and what kinds of accommodations or specially designed instruction do we need to support the family to understand how to do um, so that they can embed it into their daily routine. Um, we do have an implementation plan that Connecticut produced. It came out in that adapt, achieve something document, but it doesn't really mean, this is kind of, if you're gonna change the IEP, it doesn't really meet that, that need. And I do want to, you guys are gonna um, get a chance. You're actually gonna do two things in your small group, but I wanted to show you one other example. Hopefully if my technology, 
works. Do you now see um, something different, not the PowerPoint on your slide, on your screen? So um, Andrea Brunell and Michelle Levy have created some resources related to remote learning, distance learning for preschool aged children. There's three um, webinars that have been recorded that are posted on the SDE and the OEC websites. There's also a link on the last page um, of the PowerPoint to that resource. But um, so what they created was this document that helped to show how, sorry, I'm having uh, technology, helped to show how uh, families could embed Connecticut early learning and development standards into their home routine. And all I did was take this chart. So it might look familiar. I'm not sure how many people watched that webinar. That was the first one that they did. And basically it's just another example of an implementation plan, right? So, I'm sorry. Um, these are, why are we not moving up? That's why. These are the domains from our ELDS, right? which again, if we're writing standards informed IEPs, we should have connections to in our IEPs. And so that's all I've done is add, here is a child, Cheryl, it's not Anne Marie anymore, who has um, an objective on her IEP about using feelings words, both positive and negative feelings words, um, identifying feelings and using those words to express her feelings. That falls nicely into um, the social and emotional domain on the CTLs. And this is, again, an example of a home implementation plan. So we would support the family to think about, well, if you're making pancakes with feeling faces, on your pancakes. That was their example that was already there. So I went with it. <laughs> I'm not really sure how you make pancake faces with feelings, but as chip. <laughs> chocolate chips. Thank you. <laughs> um, as you're doing that routine, right, um, you can encourage the family to talk about feelings words, right, um, and encourage them to make a feeling face and ask their child, what feeling is my face making right now, right? Um, this child also has a math objective, and one of their other um, examples was about making lunch, right, and asking your child, how many people are in our family, how, who's going to eat lunch today, how many people is that, we need napkins, you can hold out the napkins and ask them to count. So again, I just wanted to connect it to a resource that you may have already seen, um, but um, also serves the same purpose as creating an implementation plan. So Amory, there's a question in the chat that this might be a really good time to, to address this um, regarding data collection. So if we are supporting families, um, mm -hmm. could be parents, grandparents, uh, for supporting families in the home to to implement, mm -hmm. um, what does data collection look like during sure. distance teaching and learning? Right. So again, just like any time that we're collecting data, we make decisions based on what is happening. So, um, and I think we, we're not asking families to analyze data. We want them to share it with us and then we can do our job. Um, and Natalia, I see objectivity, but maybe you could elaborate on that. But anyway, so you could, and actually we just did this with a program as part of your planning, um, they could videotape making pancakes. Um, if you're using an app like Seesaw or Padlet or that kind of thing, right, then they could access that. Um, so they could videotape the routine. Um, you could 
send a uh, survey or a form for them to fill out, but right, let's face it, families are probably, there. there's a lot going on at home. So doing things like that is less likely to come back to you, but pictures or video clips that they could um, return to you um, is one way, right, that they could collect data. So, Amory, one of the things that um, a lot of uh, districts that we work in that are using, for example, Seesaw, what they're reporting is that um, families like to share two things on Seesaw. Uh -huh. One, the successes. Here's yes. what you, you know, told me to do, showed me to do. Here's an example of success. They also like to share, here's the problems I'm experiencing. Right. So, you get, so you get to see, which, think about how rich that data is, though. Yeah. And it provides an opportunity then for those discussions as far as, okay, so that's an area that you struggle with every day that your child struggles with. All right, let's kind of task analyze, take it apart so we can give you some strategies um, to, to support your child's um, whatever it is, whatever routine it is. Right. I also, so in the training that we just um, did, some teachers were sharing that they got the video and they could hear, let make an older sibling that wasn't in the screen prompting the child like counting or right so it wasn't but even with that when you think about the learning opportunity right so it's kind of that um the, and what's the important part that the child has an opportunity to gain that knowledge or skill and certainly the interaction with a sibling and the connection at that moment but the other thing i was going to say about um data collection too is that depending on the family you may do the data collection in a more, you know, in your Zoom with the child or family, right? So um, it might be a combination of both things. Working on that objective, you may have some structured um, time, but some of it is evaluating what we're doing during that Zoom time. It's kind of, again, it's sort of like when we have children in our class, have you ever completely abandoned a learning experience because no one is interested in it, right? So it's a little bit of that, like we're, le we're learning too. And it is very much about, we're in that phase I think right now where we have to reflect, is it working? What's working? What went well in a remote lesson? What hasn't gone well? and do the stuff that's going well. Um, and don't do the stuff that's not going well. So there's a, uh, Natalia actually kind of expanded, how are we um, going to use parents' data for students' report cards as written four out of five trials? <laughs> well, that, um, that's a good question. And I, I, I do think the data collection piece is something that, again, in those like um, smaller PLCs is something we should be diving deeper into. But again, um, you may have to do that, right? In your Zoom um, to apply that kind of criteria. I'm not really, I don't know. And other people, please feel free to chime in. We're, we're learning too. But again, as I'm thinking about like families to say to them, okay, do it five times and record what happened each of those times. I don't know, what do other people think? So I think one strategy that I thought about is that again, when it comes to collecting data based on that level of criteria, you might need to do that in your interaction with children. Or you could rewrite how you well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's another option. Um, the, right, and that sort of um, came up when you think about that embedded matrix, right? Um, I think one of the things that we have has been highlighted that has produced a struggle is that sometimes we have IEPs written that special education amount of service equals the amount of time the child was in the classroom. Does anybody have that, have IEPs written that way? And so 
when we're doing a really good job and being really intentional about analyzing access and how need impacts access and participation, we start to realize that, let's see if I can pull it back up. Um, we start to realize that when we use the act embedded activity matrix, so much. What, tell, see, now you need to tell me what you see on your screen. Do you see the embedded activity matrix? Okay. Um, right? We start to realize that is a child, and then if we had other objectives plotted here, are they really receiving um, special education services two and a half hours or four hours? a day every single day? Um, and maybe the answer is no. So when we get to this place where we are, and now you're trying to figure out how do I give two and a half hours a day of special education to a child in a, who's entirely remote? Um, again, I think that's another practice that has popped up that makes us maybe have to pause and go, hmm, I wonder if we're, um, that's something that we need to change. And this this speaks to that practice where, because um, it is a practice and we've seen it a lot on IEPs, but we have to go back, special education isn't a place. So just because they're in that classroom and there's a special ed teacher in the classroom does not mean that they're receiving the service for that entire two and a half hours. Okay, because special education isn't a person, so it's not just me. And it's not a place, it's a service. So we have to really kind of shift our thinking through that lens. And again, like this, this tool can help us um, be able to do that. You could use it in planning amount of service um, in the development of an IEP. Once you've identified goals and objectives, right? And then asking these questions, um, and that's really the way that the decision-making process is supposed to flow anyway. That's why services are at the end of the IEP. Okay. So we don't really have time for, I'm gonna stop sharing again. Other questions, comments that have come up or that you still have, um, we'll share the PowerPoint and the forms if you want to be able to use them. Um, the decision-making guide, I guess I would just add, I ask you if you have questions and then I keep talking. Um, the decision-making guide is not meant for you to fill out all the time for everything. It's really just meant to sort of prompt your thinking to make sure that we're going back to what is the goal for all kiddos and can this child access and participate in that instruction that's being delivered to achieve that goal or do we need to do something different? And then really, again, ultimately the implementation plan helps us be able to document clearly, yep, we are providing SDI and accommodations. We are meeting our requirements for implementing the child's IEP. So Amory, I'm, I'm not as, I don't put things as eloquently as you do, but I think I know some, a lot of the questions in the emails that I get, um, that I receive, People are trying to, they're looking for strategies on how to keep the child remote, attending to the activity they've designed mm -hmm. and they're trying to do it remotely. And so it's, there's no magic wand, but it is a definite shift of thinking. Mm -hmm. It's a definite shift of thinking because those boom cards are, that's not curriculum. Mm -hmm. The specially designed instruction is meant to be the bridge to access. And if you think about a three-year-old, what is the thing, what are the things that three-year-old is learning? I mean, when you take, if you were to do one of those embedded activity matrix for home, just like what, um, and really pick apart what goes on at home from the time the child gets out of bed, mm -hmm. okay? All the different opportunities for learning. Mm -hmm. So it's really, you got to kind of take that whole oh my, high scope or creative curriculum or whatever it is, your scholastic that you're using and put it aside and really think about those L's and what's developmentally appropriate. And then how do we help the adults that are near this child, okay? How do we support them in providing that specially designed instruction in helping them to help the child access those routines and activities? Right. 
Well, I think too, I mean, I would want to explore with people if that's what's happening, why that's the kind of learning that's being designed. But I think it also goes back to, I may not have spent enough time on the what has changed and what hasn't changed. Certainly, you know, place where children are learning has changed, but development hasn't changed, which is what you're struggling with, right? Um, so we don't have perfect answers, but really, again, what makes children want to participate in an activity, right? And, and really trying to retain that in planning, even if it is a, a remote lesson that you are, you know, delivering, what makes children, young children want to participate? They need something to touch and move around. They need something to, uh, a person to help them engage in it. Um, you know, so still those pieces haven't changed. And, and that I think is the piece that we are still trying to figure out, right? How do I still get at those things when everybody's on the other end of a screen? So Anne Marie, I, I wanted to to just chime in with one um, observation, and one is that um, what we've been talking about are graphic organizers and, and a way to lay this out in a, in a way that makes sense. And some programs may have a different way of doing that. They're still graphic organizers. It may be similar to this in many ways, and it may be different. So. Um, the assumption is everybody is developing these specially designed instructions in some kind of formalized way, whatever works for their program. And then the question, and then I think the shift that we're asking people to think about is um, how then, and this is for people to reflect upon, how then are you communicating these specially designed instructions to families, to teachers and childcare centers? How is that happening in the location where that child is currently? Yeah, yeah that's definitely another piece of the pie that has to be planned and thought about. Um, so, does anyone have yeah. questions? Or is there anything you want to contribute, share? Is there something that's working for you in your districts? What do you see as huge barriers? Or is it also 4.30 on a, <laughs> on a Wednesday and everybody spent? Um, so I guess along those lines, you will get an evaluation, but before we wrap up, can I ask uh, everybody to put in the chat box, respond just yes or no. Would you be interested in participating in a smaller group, um, regional discussion um, around this whole, all, the, all of these questions that have been answered, asked today, but continuing the discussion around planning, remote learning, de developing and delivering specially designed instruction, um, data collection, engaging families, um, would you be interested? So just in the chat box before you go, just put yes or no, just so we have some sense of whether or not continuing this conversation is something you'd like to do, but in a smaller group with more opportunity for um, discussion, problem solving, sharing of resources. How can we make um, the PowerPoint um, available to folks? Are we gonna send it out to them via email? Can we do that? I think, yeah. And then I'll attach blanks of the um, forms as well so that you can. Um... Can we post it on the, uh, the CAS website? We can also post the PowerPoint along with the video so people okay. can get it that way as well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Um, yeah. 
we appreciate it. Um, it's huge. Marie, did you want to put up your last slide so people can oh. see the link? Yes. I can also copy and paste them. And one of the resources um, on that last slide of Anne Marie's is um, a, the most recent uh, mini webinar that um, was put out jointly by the State Department of Education and Office of Early Childhood with regard to um, setting up your classroom environment and still encouraging social well, safely, um, but still developmentally appropriate um, relationships between between peers. So I it, and I've watched 16 minutes long. It's really good. So actually, that link will take you to the page where all three of the webinars that they've done um, are posted. There's one on distance learning, there's one on itinerant teaching, and there's one on environments. So thank you again, everybody. Um, and you will get some resources through email and you'll also get notification of, we will be setting up those um, small group regional things. Um, so you will be getting notice of that as well. You'll be getting notice of the things. Notice of the things. It's 4.30 in the afternoon it's for me. 4.30, <laughs> it is. Thank you everyone.